the progress of Christian missions, Acts 15, 33 to 16, verse 5. When we begin this year, we begin the message, a new beginning from Acts chapter 11, 1 to 18. And we spoke and we traced back the story of redemption to the upper house in Jerusalem where 120 disciples were silently gathered together to pray. And how Jesus said to them, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. God has a plan to save souls and God has unleashed this power of the Holy Spirit 2,000 years ago and that power continue unabated even in this present time to save souls as God's people would allow themselves to yield themselves in obedience to His Word and His Spirit. Christian mission, we said, is the work of soul winning in a spirit-led church-based setting, fulfilling the great commission that Christ gave to the church before His ascension that extends beyond the geography of this local church. So we are here, here in this dairy farm area. And God is allowing us to do some work as He carries us around this area. And the Lord would want us to be faithful, to continue to evangelize, to continue to reach out to men and women. There was this poet by the name of Philip Dudrich, 1702 to 1751. And he wrote a hymn that is entitled, Grace, This a Charming Sound. And he writes it in order to help us to see the throbbing heartbeat of a missionary. How this heartbeat of the grace of God in the life of the people, experiencing God's favour and, you know, to open our spiritual eyes, to see the riches of glory in Christ Jesus and having experienced it, continue to live and see the presence of God in our lives, helping us through life victoriously. And so this was the song that was given. If you remember, grace, this charming sound, harmonious to the ear, heaven with the echo shall resound and all the earth shall hear, saved by grace alone. You know, Jesus says that one sinner on earth who is willing to repent of the sins and all the angels in heaven would rejoice. And this is what we are saying here. How great it is for God to save a sinner. And we all know right, how precarious we are. If we are not a child of God, there was a, a Christian man of old who described the precarious state of the unsaved. Right? He, he described a little threat uh, holding a man and below is the hell fire burning and how precarious it is the thread would snap and the person would fall ah, but all by the grace of God and so he says saved by grace alone how can our eyes be open to receive Jesus Christ to know the way to heaven well it is by grace by the unmerited favour of God in our lives. So he wrote and he says, This is my plea. Jesus died for all mankind and Jesus died for me. 
This was the message of grace that began uh, with the 120 disciples energized when the Spirit of God came falling upon them, filling them. You remember, we spoke about this. Uh, Jesus set the example for mission work when he went about all the cities and villages teaching, preaching, healing. Right? And he saw the multitude, how he had compassion on them, how they fainted, were scattered as sheep having no shepherd. So we said that this work of missions is a Holy Spirit-led, systematic, spiritual endeavour to rescue souls that are fainted and scattered as sheep having no shepherd that result in the planting of new churches where souls are one, when souls are one unto God's kingdom. And we spoke how this work began. God called His man and God empowered them with His mandate and showed to them His mission. This is a map of the second missionary journey. We are going to study from now on for the next three chapters uh, in which Paul uh, together with his companions would make this long arduous journey you saw we saw earlier the first missionary journey how they covered a thousand kilometers a thousand kilometers is a long long distance okay? in those days you travel by foot uh, a little animal uh, but very slow so work was moved in a snail pace right, due to transportation limitation. But this second missionary journey, if you were to look at the, the map that is given here, would be nearly five times longer. They're going to take about nearly three to four years and they're going to travel 4,500 kilometers, very long distance, over land, over sea. They are going to travel nearly 2,000 kilometers by sea, 2,500 kilometers by land, AD 50 to AD 53. Very long time. Some of the statistics that we want to bring for you to let you see right, when God moves, He has men and women who are lost, who needs the gospel, and who will go, who will go and share that message of salvation. So we said, Christian missions began. But how is it going to progress? Uh, two thoughts for us from our text. The right time, the right men the right time from verses 33 to 36 uh, cross reference to the verse 41 and the right man right, uh, let us go again and visit that's what, that's, that was what Paul said confirming the churches and let us take with us who will go with us so God had to show them when to go and God had to show them who will go when the Lord calls and the Lord puts the burden in your heart would you go would you be prepared to go are you preparing yourself to go I have two choruses here for our spiritual strengthening the first one is follow, follow. And the second one is I will follow where he leads us. A medley of two choruses. Uh, we have the music. Follow, follow, I will follow Jesus. 
Anywhere, everywhere, I will follow on. Follow, follow, I will follow Jesus. Everywhere He leads me, I will follow on. And the second one, I will follow where He leadeth. I will pasture where He feedeth. I will follow all the way, Lord. I will follow Jesus every day. Shall we sing together the first and the second? Follow, follow, I will follow Jesus anywhere, everywhere. I will follow on. Follow, follow, I will follow Jesus everywhere He leads me. I will follow. pasture where he feedeth I will follow all the way Lord I will follow Jesus every day God prepares his people in the local church and as he prepares you he prepares your heart when you are ready the Lord would send you forth and so this chorus may encourage our hearts to the work of the gospel. And so the first thought, the right time, let us go again and visit. Now, this is our story where we left off last week. Acts 15 verse 33. And after they had tarried there or spade, they were in Antioch. Remember? Uh, last week, we said that they, Paul, together with Silas and with another of the, of the uh, mature Christian, was sent all the way from Jerusalem to Antioch in order to uh, show the message concerning the doctrine of grace, that salvation is by grace alone. Salvation is by faith alone, through Christ alone. Through the scriptures alone. And that message was handed over to the church in Antioch. It was read so the people would know that they do not have to keep the Jewish laws. They do not have to be circumcised in order to be saved. You remember, that was the contention that we saw last week, how it was resolved. Okay? And so they were there. And uh, then there was a, a man called Silas who came with them. Right, verse 34 tells us, notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. So this man, Silas, would play an uh, important role right, in uh, this second missionary journey. And you see that God has a plan to, for His kingdom. And God used men to fulfill His purpose. And you see how God brought that man Silas together with Paul and a few others with the letters to Antioch. And he remained there. Verse 35. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord and with many others. So here in Antioch, in Syria, modern day Syria, right? that's where, you know, the, that's the trouble area today. So you know that 2,000 years ago, there was a great revival. And I believe uh, that over the years, uh, I do not think that faith has left them. But very much, faith is alive in those places where the gospel was preached. And um, verse 36 says, some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren. Now, why did he say that? 
Because in the first missionary journey, they had gone to many cities in Asia Minor and there preached the gospel and there the grace of God opened the spiritual eyes of many. And so churches were established, men were brought to faith and leaders were appointed in these various churches. And then they left off to return to their headquarters in Antioch. But what happens to them after they would leave? Well, during those times when they were there, what did they do? Well, they endeavour their best to ground them in the truth, in the doctrines of the Word, and teach them how they may live their lives according to the will of God. But what happened to them after that? Well, it came to the heart of Paul that perhaps we should visit them to inquire. Today, this is what we do. We go during the weekday and we would visit someone who needs help and we would try to bring that person to church. And then we'll go back again to encourage the faith of that person, to strengthen them in the ways of God. We do so in a mini scale, as it were here. But what Paul did in his first missionary journey was that there were many souls which were saved and churches were established. And so he had to teach them the way of grace. And this was what they did. And it lay upon his heart to go and visit them. It's time. What is going on in their lives? Right? As a man who, whom God has placed that burden in the heart, for the souls of men, there is that yearning to know how are they doing? And it's interesting that, you know, if you have helped someone to come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that journey of follow-up, that journey to help that person, you know, it's not that one day thing, it could be a lifetime, lifetime of support, a lifetime of help. And this was what Paul is saying. Right, let us go. So Barnabas was his companion when, he, when they were on that first missionary journey. And he, the burden had come, the Spirit laid upon him to go. And so he says, let us go and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word. Now, you remember when they were, they were there preaching the word, there were great persecutions that came. Right? They had to run for their lives. And when they ran for their lives, the believers were there, in a sense, on their own. So they had to go back again. Right? When the situation seemed to be a little bit more calmer, where they can go back, they went back. But that was what they did in the first missionary journey. And so how are, they, how are they doing? The persecutors are still there. What will they do? Well, they said, let us go. And it was clear uh, that was the Lord leading them to make this second journey. And who will go? So Barnabas and Paul were discussing then Barnabas, it is said here, how he was determined. Right? Uh, the word there means uh, to be decided on a course of action. To take John Mark with him. Uh, it's very interesting how Paul responded. He says this, it's not good to take with him to take John Mark with them because he departed from 
he departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. So Paul, they had an experience during the first missionary journey, right, in the thick of the battle, and this man left the work. He did not continue. And for whatever reason, for whatever uh, consequence, we are not told uh, what happened. And usually, you know, in a mission work, in a mission team, each one has a role to play. And so each one would be a valuable uh, asset in that journey. And so if one would go, uh, you find that, you know, in a sense, you are a little bit crippled. And so Paul, remembering what happened and considering the spiritual stature of this man, John Mark, he says, better not, better not bring him. But Barnabas was uh, determined. The, the text there is what we call the Aries tense. Uh, he, he was set, right, a decided action that he would want John Mark to go. And so there was a sharp contention. The word there is provocation. Sharp argument. It was so sharp that they departed asunder one from another. And Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas. And they begin that missionary journey. And so the question arises, who was right? Paul or Barnabas? Well, if you were to look at the scriptures, uh, you'll find not much uh, information. But if you were to read and see, uh, you would be able to understand also that uh, the Apostle Paul uh, was one who was the man who was uh, given that apostolic ministry to the work. And so he understood, in a sense, what it entails, what are the dangers. And if you were to read on in the second missionary journey, you would find that they would have to go to jail Difficult time. They would be whipped. They would be flocked. 39 stripes. He nearly died. Those times, he was, they were stoned. So the danger, the battle is very real. And for those who are not prepared, whose heart is not ready, better not go. because they would not be able to stand the rigors, the sacrifice that is needful in a work like that. So I believe if you were to think carefully, uh, he saw uh, that this man was still spiritually uh, not ready, still immature. But later on, if you read on, you will see how Paul would commend John Mark, how he was a good man in the work of God. Right? God gave, God worked in his heart to prepare him to become spiritually mature. And he also, Paul also wrote in the book of 2 Corinthians, right, favorably of the man Barnabas. After all, Barnabas was the one who brought him Right, from Tarsus to, uh, to Antioch to begin that first, gosp uh, first missionary journey. But here we see that there was a choice to be made and who would be the person, the people who would go. Well, God decides. Right? Paul chose Silas, uh, our text tells us in verse 40, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. Well, you see here that 
you know, God has to prepare the person. And as we were reading earlier, how God brought that man, Silas. Silas was one of the mature believers from Jerusalem who came together with Paul for the work. And they went, so that's where they begin that journey. Our text tells us confirming the churches. And so, what, uh, how, can, how do we know how to choose who would be the right person for the work of God? Well, as you study this and later on from verses uh, six, chapter 16, verse 1 to 5, you would see another man, uh, Timothy, and there, you would be able to make a contrast of the two persons. Right. And uh, you see how Paul would chose Timothy to go. And what was the criteria for these choices? Well, uh, you see uh, how Timothy was uh, someone who was well reported by the brethren. Okay? Uh, there in uh, Lystra right, and Derby, and also how he was willing to be circumcised, right? go through the rite of circumcision. Uh, although his father was a Greek, mother was a Jew, uh, he don't need to be circumcised. But he, he did. He followed. Right? And how they were able, right? you would be able to see how Paul made the, a choice right? in which this man, Timothy, would follow him uh, later on. Um, as uh, someone who would uh, be valuable in the work of the gospel. Right? Uh, Paul calls him someone who is like-minded with himself. Right? Paul calls him as a son with his father. He served with me in the gospel. Right? Paul called him a minister of God, a fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, a brother my beloved son, faithful in the Lord, right? my fellow worker, my son, my own son in the faith. And so this was his, he had an upbringing. Okay? And uh, 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 Paul in the book of Timothy, in his letter to Timothy in his last days said, and this and that from a child, right, thou hast known the scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. So, this man, Timothy, was different. God had prepared him and he would go with them. And what makes uh, uh, a disciple, uh, uh, if you read the text, you'll be able to glean uh, something I would put together as uh, the acronym FAST, F-A-S-T. Faithful, available, submissive, teachable. Uh, if you look at the uh, life of Paul, at the end he said to Timothy, Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace. I'm, I have done, I have fought the good fight. Uh, my journey is done. But your journey is just beginning. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. The same commit thou to faithful men. This body of doctrine you commit to men whom you have observed and you have seen, uh, that they would be able to carry the mental, they have the spiritual capacity, the spiritual maturity to the work. Okay? And you see how John Mark uh, didn't fit the picture. He left halfway through the journey. Was he faithful? He was not faithful. Right? Was he available? Yes, he is available now to go. Well, but because of what happened the, the last time, Paul says, better not. 
better not. And if you were to study what happened in that 4,500 kilometer journey, uh, you see that they have to go through great lengths, uh, great uh, uh, hardship. Okay? And Paul, after this verse, says that you know, you, you need to, this people must be able to endure hardship as a soldier. And it's not, not easy. The spiritual character must be formed in that man. If not, it would be dangerous. Available, submissive. Right? Paul says, no, don't go. Don't leave. You have a work to do. He says, no, I'm going. I'm going back to Jerusalem. Acts 13, verse 13. All right, if you turn there, Acts 13, verse 13. It says here, now, when Paul and his company loosed from Petphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. So, the journey began, and perhaps, you know, if you are on a trip, most of the time, you know, if you go on a trip, the younger men, uh, you, you'll probably be holding, you know, uh, carrying something, uh, holding some literature. Uh, and, you know, he's a young man, probably able to hold, hold and help out, you know, to bring all these things, to make sure that, you know, everything is properly kept. And when there is some work that is needed, how to carry them, how to bring them, John Mark would be there, but John Mark was not there. Okay. Paul says, no, don't go. But he left. And so, here you see how God had to prepare the right man for his work. And in the face of the battle, you would find that The work, the souls, right, all, there are things at stake. And so Paul says, better not. And this is what we want to see here, right, how God has his men, and God prepares his men. Right, John Mark was not unuseful for the Lord, but God used him mightily later on. You see, so God has its purpose in the uh, development, in the uh, strengthening of the faith of the believers. Right. And what Paul and Barnabas or Paul and Silas would do is in this second missionary journey, is that they would have to confirm the faith of the believers. Now, you know, it is one thing to preach and give the gospel to uh, those who are unconverted. Then you bring them in. Okay. But it is another thing to bring a group of believers who are saved to spiritual maturity. There are certain aspects of their lives that need to change, need to be molded, and the Word of God is done. And that's what Jesus did, right? He had all His disciples with Him, and the disciples were always with Him. Did He, you know, hold a classroom to teach them? No, but, you know, what did they, Jesus tell them to do? Follow Me, right? As, he, as they were with Him, they would observe, they would see, and they would learn. And oftentimes, uh, you'll find that, you know, when you're on a, a visit like that, if you're a younger person, uh, you'll find that you'll be doing uh, almost nothing in the sense, you know, you'll be holding, carrying, and doing all the... But this is needful. Uh, this was what, you know, this was what is needful for that younger man John Mark. So uh, I believe 
something happened, and some work were not accomplished. And so here you see um, Paul, right? Uh, by the grace of God, together with Silas, uh, had this man called Timothy. And you see how Timothy was a fast disciple. If you read and you study, uh, he was responsible for the work in Philippi. Uh, Paul sent him to Philippi in order to confirm the faith of the people in Philippi. Paul sent him to Thessalonica, Paul sent him to Ephesus and he was charged at the close of his life to preach the word. 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 9. So you see here how God had his men for his work and God had his his people. And what, was, what we see here in the second missionary journey was uh, a, a great uh, spiritual exploit that took place. Um, one uh, writer, uh, he said this, you know, of Paul's second missionary journey. He says that this is the greatest of all the journeys. And he says, you know how he compares it? He says it outrivers the expedition of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquer right? all the way from Macedonia, all the way to India. He had his great army. Uh, but here it is said how this man, when he carried his arms and civilization of Greece into the heart of Asia, and then he's, you know, uh, it was com uncomparable, incomparable with Caesar. How Caesar landed on the shores of Britain. Okay. And how Columbus landed in America, in the New World. Paul's missionary journey, he says, far exceeds because of the sheer number of churches and sheer number of believers, strategic. So, as a child of God, right, you find that you know, God has a purpose, has a, a, a place for, the, for His work in your life. And I believe that God would want us to know right, what is His purpose for us, what is... He's calling for you. And we do it according as God would want us to. And I believe that, you know, there would be a great prospering, great prospering of uh, your life as you yield yourself to the Lord for His own honour, for His own glory. Let us pray. Father, we want to thank Thee for thy mercy. Thank thee for showing to us the beginning of this second missionary journey, how progress can be made in Christian missions. The right time, the people of God waiting upon God to be sent and the right men, how God would raise men of valor, men of the scriptures, men who are prepared by thee. O oh God, we pray that thou would also prepare men to serve thee for this generation. Lord, we pray and commit ourselves into thy hand. May thou prepare us that indeed we may be the person that thou would want us to be, to serve thee with the life that, the remaining life that we have. This I pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.